AP Biology, Chapter 37, Part 2. Water uptake by plants is a result mainly of osmosis, and we're talking about going from high water potential to low water potential within the roots. This causes root pressure, and that root pressure is a little push from the roots to push up the water. However, it's not much of a push. Most of the pull to bring the water up is due to transpiration, which is adhesion, cohesion, and evaporation then from the leaves. Now, how do plants take up cations, positively charged ions? You can know it's, you know it's a positively charged ion because that little T looks like a little plus sign. Now, this mechanism relies on hydrogen ions, protons, and it's a, a type of active transport. So this is how the plants do it. They pump the protons out. The protons have a positive charge and bind to soil particles that are negatively charged. When the hydrogen ions that are positive bind to the negatively charged soil particles, it um, replaces any other positively charged ions, like calcium, that are attached to soil particles. The calcium ions are now freed up, and now the calcium ions can diffuse into the root hairs. Without the hydrogen ions being released by the plants, the cations are kind of stuck to these soil particles. So this is how plants take up uh, minerals, especially positively charged minerals. Go ahead and write this down and pause at this time. Step one, hydrogen ions pumped out of root hairs, active transport. Step two, hydrogen ions bind to negatively charged soil particles, freeing up positively charged calcium and other positively charged ions that plants need. And then the calcium and other ions can move into the root hairs. All right, rule of soils. Uh, there's a couple of different things involved with soils. Uh, the composition, what it's made of, and its texture and structure, the size of the soil particles. Uh, essentially, soil is made up of rock and dead remains of plants and animals, as well as var various microorganisms. Topsoil is the most important for plant growth. If there was, um, uh, when we had the 1930s, we had the topsoil blown off by the dust, uh, dust storms, and we lost that rich organic material that was in the topsoil. The stuff underneath is not as good as uh, for growing. Rich in organic matter uh, has a uh, name, and that's called hummus, and not to be confused with something that you dip uh, pita chips in. Hummus is a uh, decomposing organic material rich in dead organisms, feces, fallen leaves, and other organic refuse, and they're being broken down by bacteria and fungi. This is the good stuff for growing uh, plants. It improves the soil texture, and it's a reservoir of uh, minerals, lots of organic material. The organisms inside, there's tons of them. One teaspoon of topsoil has 5 billion, over 5 billion, about 5 billion, uh, fungi, algae, proteins, insects, bacteria, and nematodes like uh, worms. Let's go ahead and write this down, especially the hummus. You don't have to necessarily know the bottom part here, but you should know of what hummus is and what topsoil is and why it's important. All right, so soil health is a global issue. We had a problem with this in the 1920s and um, early 30s. During the 1920s, we had Dust Bowl. We didn't have any soil conservation. We uh, were growing wheat and raising cattle, and the cattle were uh, basically eating all the crops that held the soil in place. So uh, the roots of plants actually hold the soil in place, which is a good thing. Nowadays, we don't have just empty fields anymore. We try to plant something there just so the roots hold it in place. We also had a drought, a lack of uh, water, and we had a lot of wind blowing away all that topsoil. It caused some real problems. So we have some uh, solutions to that. Uh, you should be familiar with some of this stuff. Uh, the one I really want you to know is cover crops. Cover crops hold the soil in place. Let's write that down. Cover crops hold the soil in place. A lot of times we use cover crops like legumes that have nitrogen-fixing bacteria on their, on their nodules. So um, not only are they holding the soil in place, but they're also fixing nitrogen for the next crop that will be planted there. Crop rotation is where we uh, rotate different crops that use different nutrients. If we keep on planting corn in the same place over and over again, corn needs some nutrients more than others, and it will rob the soil of those nutrients. When we rotate it with different crops, we don't use up all the nutrients as quickly. We kind of, uh, kind of stagger the, um, the depletion of nutrients within the soil. We especially rotate crops occasionally with uh, legumes like uh, um, soybeans and peanuts in order to return nitrogen back to the soil. If you don't do that, the soil becomes used up for macronutrients like phosphorus, and nitrogen, potassium. Global issues, so fertility, you know, having uh, that topsoil um, runoff as a result of uh, erosion. Irrigation, bringing water to the areas that, uh, you know, you're growing plants. Forest destruction, uh, we have a, an issue with the, uh, you know, uh, habitats of various animals being destroyed as a result of needing more farmland. All right. 
All right. Fertilizers are a combination of uh, three things, and you need to know this. Nitrogen, potassium, K, and phosphorus, NPK. So there'll be uh, different uh, ratios of these three uh, Free macronutrients that plants need. Now, what about carbon and oxygen, hydrogen? Well, that's in the atmosphere or in the water, so there's no problems there. But nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are found in the soil, and that's why they can run out. Now, we have organic fertilizers like manure, compost, fish meal. All those are just dead animals, basically, or the uh, waste products of animals. Uh, here we have uh, compost as dead plants that have been broken down. Chemical fertilizers, commercially produced, uh, using the Haber process, about 40% of our food, our crops, are uh, the result of this fertilizer uh, that was made commercially called um, the Haber process to make nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, specifically nitrogen, nitrates. Nitrogen uptake, we've talked about this in a previous class. Here we have nitrogen in the atmosphere. That's free nitrogen, not usable by plants because of the triple bond. Now this nitrogen that can't be used by plants or any living thing other than these archaebacteria, these are actually archaebacteria, can um, fix this nitrogen and combine it into different forms. But nitrogen-fixing bacteria can do that. So what the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, NFB, do is combine nitrogen with, um, with hydrogen to form ammonia. So that's the first step, nitrogen fixation, converting gaseous nitrogen to ammonia. The second step that you should know, and you should write this down, is that the ammonia is converted into um, nitrates. Now there's a little step here, ammonia and then ammonium. You don't have to know that. But you should know that once the uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria convert the nitrogen to ammonia or ammonium, then we're going to have nitrifying bacteria, NB, make nitrates. Now plants can use nitrates. They can't use ammonia. They can't use nitrogen gas. Then nitrates are used by the plants uh, for making things like uh, their nitrogen bases for DNA and RNA, as well as the NCC backbone of amino acids and proteins. We also have one last bacteria, denitrifying bacteria, converts nitrates back to nitrogen gas, back to the atmosphere. And this is the nitrogen cycle. Let's pause at this time. If you already know this, then uh, I guess you don't have to write anything down. But you should know each one of these steps. All right, moving on. Soybean root nodules have lots of nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and uh, these are found on a family called legumes that include peanuts and soybeans. Write that down. Rhizobium bacteria, nitrogen fixation, legumes. Cover crops. Cover crops are uh, planted when um, the field is going to lay bare. And uh, the reason why is because, uh, in part, because we don't want the soil to blow away. If there's no crops with roots uh, holding the soil in place, we can have the same thing that happened in the 1920s with the Dust Bowl. Another th reason why we have cover crops uh, is to return nitrogen to the soil. And I mentioned that earlier. It's usually a legume. Remember, legumes have nodules on their roots filled with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And when they fix that nitrogen, they, um, they make nitrogen available uh, for other plants. So what they'll do is they'll just plow them back under into the dirt, not even harvest the soybeans or the peanuts. They're both legumes. Soybeans, peanuts, both legumes. And um, return the nitrogen to the soil. So it kind of regenerates the soil in a way. Also, if you're ever traveling through like Kansas and Nebraska, uh, you'll see these like big rows of trees. And these big rows of trees are windbreak. And this is another thing to kind of slow down erosion. If you have all these trees planted in a row, when the wind comes by, the, the wind is stopped by the trees and you don't blow away your soil. So notice that next time you're driving on the major highways. Here's a little joke here. A man outstanding in his field. A man out standing in a field. All right, let's make sure you write that down. Cover crops, legume, holds the soil in place, returns nitrogen back to the soil. Usually something like soybeans. All right, we have some plant oddities. Remember, plants are autotrophs. They're not heterotrophs. Even the carnivorous plants still have to do photosynthesis. If you put a Venus flytrap inside of a, um, um, a darkened room or any of these parasitic plants in a cave, uh, they'll die. They still have to do photosynthesis to make their sugars. So basically, all these plants that are parasitic are just getting some of the things that they don't normally get from, from the non-living part of their environment. Here we have mistletoe. Mistletoe is a parasitic plant. It's kind of interesting. Think about Christmas. It actually taps into the vascular tubes of uh, the plant it lives on and steals 
nutrients and sugars from the plant it's living on. In peat bogs, we have an acid, a uh, high acid environment. So uh, the nitrogen um, and other things that uh, normally would be taken up by plants uh, aren't taken up by plants. So plants that live in high acid environments have adaptations to get their nutrients elsewhere from living things. These guys live in nitrogen poor soil. Let's go and write that down, nitrogen poor soil. Venus flytraps get their nitrogen supplement from insects. So when they close their uh, leaves, and they do that by water pressure, they just release water and the thing closes up. It doesn't have a lot of strength, so it's not like we could like take off your finger or something. And then enzymes within the plant break down the, the fly or whatever it catches until it um, absorbs some of that nitrogen. And again, the reason why it's doing it is not for food. It's still doing photosynthesis. It's to get some of the nitrogen it's not getting from the soil. Here we have the pitcher plant. It's kind of the same thing. Uh, or a similar thing, it's a carnivorous plant. In the bottom is a very sticky mess of goo that uh, has enzymes in it. When the uh, insects get in there, they get stuck and then they get used for nitrogen. Here's some more pitcher plants. We find these in the Everglades in Florida and they are a carnivorous plant. They will eat insects, but not for energy, for nitrogen. Peat. I don't want to talk about that. All right, so we have uh, the end of part two of chapter 37. Make sure you review this information. Next time we uh, have class, we'll be going on to part, uh, part one of chapter 38.